Okay, um, can someone confirm if they are listening? Yes, sir. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, last lecture. Any any questions uh, in on that? Okay, can you can you see my screen, Abhijit? Roshan. Yes, sir. Good, good. Let's move. Uh, <clears throat> so now uh, we, uh, if you remember last time, we discussed that we have energy losses in a channel, and these energy losses are extremely important when when we design open channel open channels. This energy loss basically is resistance to flow. In this lecture, we basically want to develop a relationship of state of flow, that's Reynolds number, and friction factor. Friction factor will give us overall friction or overall resistance to flow. When we have resistance to flow, we have to use some energy for flow to happen. So that's what we will discuss in this lecture, uh, friction flow and Reynolds number relationship. So before that, we have to know that energy losses, um, how do they happen? How does uh, flow, how is flow being resisted? So we have different properties. For example, resistance to flow depends on the channel property. Let's say if your channel is smooth, then there'll be less resistance to flow. But on the other hand, if your channel is rough, then flow resistance will be uh, high. That is because at the boundaries, you have some eddies being formed that basically oppose the flow. So channel properties include roughness of the channel and also they include shape of the channel. The shape of the channel, for example, if you have circular, cir circular channel uh, shape, uh, that will have less resistance. So that will have less secondary flows forming. Secondary flows are basically those flows which are not exactly in uh, in parallel to the flow, but they are perpendicular to the direction of flow. For example, if you have, this is your channel bed, and then you have flow going this way. The secondary flows are formed when the flow, when the, uh, because of some disturbances, you have some small flows that are either perpendicular to this flow on this direction or in the other uh, lateral direction. So that those are secondary flows. In rectangular channels, for example, you have secondary flows forming more. So uh, as compared to circular flows or trapezoidal or uh, triangular sections. Now, can you see anything? Yes, sir. Yeah, now it's visible, sir. Okay, I see, I see. So there was some problem, I guess. Uh, let, let us try to see how we can clear that. Uh, So now it's visible. No, is is it visible now also? Uh, yes, sir. Now it's visible. Earlier it was some showing some blank screen. Okay. Uh, now the entire screen is visible or no? Uh, means this third slide is visible. Yes, sir. Okay. Good. 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 Um, let me know if it is not if uh, it somehow uh, becomes blank. So then the second uh, property that basically resistors flow is your fluid property right it depends on the viscosity of the flow fluid you can have more resistance or low resistance for example highly viscous uh, fluids they offer more resistance to flow if you want to move for example honey or oil which has higher viscosity than air you will notice that uh, to move same quantity of uh, honey at same speed you will need more energy as compared to air. As compared to air, so that is the second property that um, gives us the resistance to flow, basically energy loss or to overall friction. That the third thing that uh, resistance depends on is actual flow property. For example, uh, if you have high velocity, now when for a for a same discharge Q, high velocity will. Uh, Next time, we'll try to see what's the best solution so everybody sees. But as of now, I don't know what's the exact solution. Um, so actually, it's freezing sometimes. OK, it's freezing. OK, OK. So that may be internet connection. Right? That, that could be internet connection problems. The speed might be low.
Yes, sir. Now third slide is visible. I think. Okay, good. So let's move on. So we discussed that resistance of flow. It depends on multiple properties that include channel properties, fluid properties, and flow properties. Now we'll discuss. Uh, see, like I last time said, open channels. We do not have exact uh, theoretical, you know, equations that we can just use because of a lot of complexities that we discussed last time. But we can see if we can get something from smooth pipes, you know, if we can get some uh, useful equations from pipe flow. Here are some equations that, are that have been developed theoretically for smooth pipes. You might have heard about Dar Darcy West batch uh, friction head that is applicable to smooth pipes and laminar flow. Okay, in that you might have seen that head loss in a pipe is basically F times L divided by diameter and this velocity head, right? So uh, if we little bit solve that, we say, okay, if our energy gradient, which is basically loss of head per unit distance, if we call that S, we can say this F is basically, it, we can rewrite that in this equation. Sir, uh Sir, you are on which slide? You are on four or third only? Uh, I think this is um, third. One, two, three, fourth. I think. Let us see. Fourth slide. I'm on fourth slide. Because we have freeze in my screen. I have freeze to third only. Now it's smooth. Now, now it's <laughs> coming. Yes. Sir. So once try to unshare and share, so maybe that problem will solve. Say that again. Uh, unshare and share again. I mean, uh, first okay, okay. Yeah, let, let's try that. Yeah, let's try that also. Okay, can you now see? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now it's visible. Okay, so uh, we were discussing um, uh, smooth channels, right? And we discussed Darcy Westpatch equation in that. And we said that friction factor that is in Darcy Westpatch equation, that friction factor basically gives us the overall uh, friction or overall resistance to flow. And uh, we can still simplify that, this equation. We know Reynolds number is this, and we can change that equation to the small, by, by small manipulation, we see F is equal to K divided by RE, where RE is Reynolds number that is given by this equation. And K, we can see from when we solve this, we see K is 8G divided by nu, R squared divided by V and S. Now notice that if we keep 8 is constant, G is constant, nu for fluid is constant, S also we can assume constant, S is also sometimes slope of the channel. So what we see that K depends only on the this ratio. And that ratio for a specific discharge, let's say Q is equal to 20 meter cube per second. That ratio is constant for one shape type. Okay. So this F only depends on the shape of the channel here. So K. And that, this is true for laminar flow. We have Darcy West batch equation for laminar flow in smooth pipes. So this pipe flow. But when we have turbulent flow, where Reynolds number is high, 750 to 25,000, for example, then Blas's equation is applicable. That again is uh, still for uh, smooth pipes, okay, not for open channels yet. But if the Reynolds number is even higher, more than 25,000, we have another theoretical equation that is Prandtl von Kármán equation. So these these three equations uh, for laminar and turbulent flow, they are based on smooth pipes okay so it's still pipe flow it's not open channel flow for open channel flow we have experimental data okay or field data here i show the field data and i compare that field data with um, the equations that we presented for pipe flow uh, this this plot is for smooth channels and this plot is for rough channels I kept them uh, side by side. The Chow book, which we mainly use, they have given on different pages. But I think that if we, if I do it this way, it might be easier for you to understand uh, the differences between smooth and rough channels. 
Now this is this is data on this axis. On x axis we have Reynolds number on log scale, and on y axis we have the friction factor that also is on log scale. Um, the one thing is evident here that as the Reynolds number increases, you have slope changes, clear slope change. So up to ten, up to one thousand, for example, or less than one thousand four hundred, the slope is something else. But after that, the slope is something else. So that that gives us clear indication that the flow has changed from laminar to turbulent flow. Okay, because the slope has changed. Uh, that's a typical uh, see, thing we can see. Uh, that is not only for smooth channels, but that's also for rough channels. Also, we see that uh, before transition we have laminar flow. Then after that the slope changes and we get turbulent flow. That is first thing. The the second thing we see here is this open open uh, circles is for triangular channel, and uh, the closed circle is for rectangular channels. So these are experimental data only. Um, then these lines here, straight lines, are two equations. F is equal to twenty four divided by R, and F is equal to fourteen divided by R. So we see in laminar region this part, we have a straight line equation, right? So that means the experimental data is actually following darcy wessbach equation with different k values. Here for uh, rectangular channels, k is 24. And for uh, triangular channels, k is 14 divided by r. So, so obviously, that darcy wessbach equation we can still use for smooth channels in laminar flow. And if we compare that with the uh, rough channels, this is your equation F14 divided by R that was applicable for smooth channels. The, the, the line is still straight. So the slope is still decreasing with Reynolds number because the velocity is increasing. So, but only thing, it, thing is it's a little bit parallel. So the friction is a little bit higher, obviously, because the pipes are rough. So we have those those equations. Uh, they are still applicable, but we just need to modify them a little bit. So that is for the laminar uh, flow. Any any questions in this? What we are doing here, or you have confusions? If you if you respond, then I will understand that okay, some I am doing something. But if you don't respond, it seems to me I am talking. Um, to no one, sir. sir in well. smooth channel, uh, why this is straight line because the relation is 14 by r, so it should be a curve, hyperbolic curve from the side. Uh, both axes are on same scale. You see, this is also log scale, this is lo a log scale, so that's why. Okay, okay, okay. Why, why now? Why this is log scale because r changes too much. The hydraulic radius, if you put a same scale, if you have 10 here, then 100 will be somewhere here, then 1000 will be somewhere here, and this will go beyond you know, this uh, board. So that's why we put on log scale, both both things we have put on log scale, they are put on, otherwise, you know, X will be too big. Does that make sense? Okay, sir, yeah. Okay. Sir, sir one more thing. Sure. Uh uh, sir, how we told like which one is smooth channel? How we bifurcate like which is smooth channel, which is rough channel? Yes, yes. So that's a good question. Here, here they are saying okay, um, we are using structural steel. Here also structural steel. But if you notice here, uh, these two, one is open circle, one is closed circle. They have some parameter called k. I was going to discuss this. K basically is the dimension of the particles at the surface, at the bed surface. For example, for this, k is 0 0.0019 inches. So that will tell us, OK, how much uh, surface is rough. OK, if this value is too small, and we can assume this is OK, uh, smooth surface. For example, if, if you put k is equal to 0, 0.00 something, this line will become even parallel to the smooth surfaces. Any any other question? Does that answer your question to some extent? Uh, ah, yeah, yes, sir. It's fine now. Okay, good. Uh, so that was a laminar range. Uh, we we see that okay, the pipe flow equations may be applicable. 
now if we if we move to turbulent flow range uh, in smooth pipes first we see that on, it doesn't matter whether that channel is rectangular or channel is triangular all the data seem to be following same line you know same slope and uh, in that case we all here they have also plotted uh, Prandtl uh, von Kármán equation and Blasius equation. Blasius equation is only up to this, uh, varied up to this Reynolds number. But Prandtl uh, von Kármán is applicable to beyond that value of Reynolds number. And different lines, one is bold and one is dashed. But we see that the data actually follows those equations pretty well, right? So we can see that even in turbulent flow, uh, the, the friction factor follows uh, uh, this pipe flow equations. So that, that is all good. But an, another point that we notice here is that the shape doesn't matter in turbulent flow here. Now, if we move to uh, rough channels and we plot, here we have different data. This is data from Warwick, um, some one scientist, then and we also have data from University of Miss, Miss, uh, Minnesota. So that is given here. Uh, here also we see that, okay, that equation is here, but the data is a little bit up. So the equation is being followed, but not exactly the same line, but it's just parallel to Prandtl, von Kármán, and Blass's equation. Not exactly following that line, but still parallel to that line. For example, different, here we are different uh, hydraulic radiuses. We see that if hydraulic radius increases, this becomes more parallel. Now, two things we can notice here in uh, rough channels. One is there is sudden increase of this line. So that people have said it's not very clear why that is happening. That might be only the that might be only because of you know data was not uh, perfect. But another thing that we notice in some plots after some time the line becomes parallel. You know whatever Reynolds number you have friction factor does not change in some plots. It is observed. So that some people call it is complete turbulence case. In, at that point, Reynolds number does not, sorry, friction factor does not depend on Reynolds number. It only depends on the hydraulic radius and uh, pipe roughness. So those are some um, points that uh, we uh, I wanted to share with you on smooth and rough channels. Because uh, we, we have to understand friction factor. This will be used uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the course because we need to know the energy losses. So I, I can summarize these uh, for you, uh, same, one by one. On this side, we have smooth channels. And on this side, we have rough channels. What we saw that flow changes from laminar to turbulent as Reynolds number increases in both the cases, because we saw that there is a clear change of slope in transitional flow zone. That was true for both smooth and rough channels. Now in a laminar flow, we saw that, okay, this equation, darcy Westbridge almost is applicable. K is 24 for rectangular channels and K is 14 for triangular channels. We also discussed how shape affects the uh, friction factor. That is basically the resistance to flow or energy losses. And in uh, laminar re region, in rough channels, we also see that this is again followed, but K is a little bit higher because obviously uh, we have rough channels. We don't have smooth channels now. So roughness should be a little bit higher. In turbulent region, we saw that in smooth channels, this these two equations are almost exactly followed, but in rough channels, they are not exactly followed. They are still parallel to Prandtl von Kármán equation these three points. Then uh, in smooth channels, in turbulent range, the shape does not matter. It does not affect friction. But in turbulent, in, in rough channels, that matters. And then we also observe that in some plots, some figures, uh, we have complete turbulence in some figures, in, in, in which case, the friction factor is independent of Reynolds number. So those are some observations. But I wanted to uh, tell you that the laminar flow uh, is not uh, is very rare in open channel flow. You might you might see that okay flow is smooth at the surface, uh, it might be laminar, but that is very 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 rare in open channel flow. All most of the time we have turbulent flow, so we we might be using Blasius or Prandtl equation more than 
laminar um, this Darcy West batch equation. Uh, any questions on that? Okay, I take that you don't have any question. If that means you understood everything. So hopefully that's the case. Now that was <coughs> state of flow when viscosity was involved. Now we can again have state of flow when we compare inertial forces with gravitational forces. Okay, uh, for that we have fluid number, which is basically V divided by root of G Y actually. But in this, in open channel flow, we take Y as hydraulic depth. What is what is hydraulic depth? It is basically channel section area divided by top width. If you have this is your channel, whatever area you are getting, so that will be this much, this much, and the top width is this point to this point. This is your top width up to this. Okay, so that will be your top width. So from this area divided by T, you can get top uh, D. D is equal to a divided by T. Anyhow, so that, that is a uh, fruit number. It gives us the relative strength of inertial forces with respect to the gravitational forces. Now you might observe if you do, you know, when we do gravity, when we do wave analysis later in unsteady flow, uh, we have specific types of, types of waves. Those are called gravity waves. When we analyze those waves, we see that the velocity of the wave is same as GD, root of GD. So we call that as celerity. So this root of GD is basically equal to small uh, celerity of small scale uh, gravity waves. What are those gravity waves? I have defined here a little bit. These are basically waves generated in shallow channels. When the depth is disturbed, momentary, and locally. That means that when the depth is disturbed suddenly, only for a small period of time and at a particular location. So then we have some waves being generated. What in those waves we call gravity waves. Now, why do we call those gravity waves? For example, if you drop a pebble in a uh, in small uh, pond or a lake, you will see that by dropping the pebble, some waves are generated. Those waves are generated because once dropping the panel displaces some water. So the depth increases at some point. And that depth, basically, the flow that the water wants to attain its equilibrium position, the previous position. So the flow wants to come back, but it happens everywhere on all the um, uh, every in all the locations. The flow wants to come back, so they again strike. So that cause because of the gravitational forces, gravitation pull wants to, the equilibrium to be attained. So there is a back and forth uh, flow happening, and that generates gravity waves. So the speed of that wave is celerity, and that has been shown equal to root of GD. And on the basis of this, we can define the state of flow. Now, in open channels, most flow is governed by gravity for forces all, only. So we'll see what types of what states of flow we can have based on um, gravity. Any any questions on this, Roshan? No, sir. Abhijit? No, sir. Everything is fine. OK, good. Now moving on. Uh, so based on uh, gravity, what we have here, we said inertial forces and gravitational forces. When, the, when fruit number is 1, we call that flow as subcritical. When, uh, in that case, the depth of flow is too high or the velocity of flow is too low. When the depth of flow is too high, that means gravitational pull is more than the velocity of the flow. So obviously, that is a subcritical flow. And that is given by fruit number being less than 1, which will imply if this guy is less than 1, or this is less than 1. So basically, velocity of the flow is less than the celerity of uh, gravity wave. So if you drop, if you have a river channel that is flowing with velocity v, and then suddenly, for example, you drop a pan, uh, pebble in that river channel, and their waves will be generated. Now, if those waves, uh, if those waves travel upstream because the velocity of the flow is less than the celerity, then we say the flow is super subcritical. On the other hand, 
if the velocity of the flow is too high. So the water is flowing at very high uh, velocity. So this guy is greater than one. Fluid number is greater than one, which will imply velocity of the flow is more than celerity. We call that as supercritical flow. Now, obviously, if you drop a pebble in the channel, there will be gravity waves formed, but those gravity waves, waves will not travel upwards because the flow of, flow of the water is too high. They will travel downstream. Or oh, that, that will be your supercritical flow. Uh, that, that was those were two types of two uh, states of flow based on gravity. We have third, which rarely happens, is basically critical flow. In that case, the velocity of the uh, flow and the celerity they become equal. So if you drop a pebble, the waves are formed there. Those waves do not propagate; they stay at the same place because the velocity of the flow and the celerity are same. So that that will be three types of uh, three states of flow. Here we show, uh, this is from Munson book, Fundamentals of Fluid Mechanics. If the fluid number is equal to one, we have critical flow. If the fru fluid number is less than one, we have subcritical flow. And if the fluid number is more than one, we have supercritical flow. Now, based on gravity, how can we in a canal uh, visually identify subcritical or supercritical flow? Who, who can tell that? So the question is, again, I repeat, how we can visually identify subcritical or supercritical flow in a channel? So the same thing. Direction of gravity waves. Yes, direction of gravity waves. So uh, yeah, that is uh, correct. Anyone else who wants to elaborate that more? Abhijit, I think you were saying something. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, I was saying something. Sir, same okay. thing, sir. We will go and we will drop uh, this stone and we see where the gravity waves are traveling. Like if it's upstream, uh -huh. then we will say it's subcritical, and if they are downstream, it uh -huh. should be super critical. Good, good, good. Very good. So, okay. Now, another question uh, with this Who can tell me what a gravity wave is and why is it called a gravity? Like, why is the term gravity there? Because see, I will keep asking questions because that will tell me whether you are listening, you are actually uh, online or not, right? Yes, Rago. Okay, so gravity there it is called because um, Rago. Okay, yeah, yeah. So do you have answer, Rago? Okay, okay, okay. So the 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 reason why they are called gravity waves is initially uh, the depth is same throughout you know the uh, throughout lake for example or a canal. But when you drop a panel, when, when you drop a pebble, you basically disturb that depth. The depth increases momentarily at one point, and the depth decreases momentarily at another point where you drop the pebble. So then the flow wants to attain its equilibrium position, right? So when you increase the depth, it, uh, the gravitational pull tries to bring it back to its equilibrium position. So that is because of gravitational pull because there's a slope. So, and again, this happens on all the sides because pebble may be circular and all the sides, the gravitational pull tries to bring all the particles back together. And when they come back, they hit each other and again, a wave is generated. So that is the reason it is called a gravitational pull. So Rago, Rago is also saying, I think, uh, correct, said that it is basically accelerated mass. Anyhow, so though, though that is the reason why we have a uh, wave there. So again, visually, like uh, uh, we noticed, and uh, Madhav also said that if we drop a panel and we see that the wave is generated, they are moving upwards, we will know that the velocity of flow is too less. So it's a subcritical flow. And if the waves, they are moving down downstream, then we'll know that the uh, velocity is too high. So that is supercritical flow.
when i say downstream that means the flow is happening from top from one top level to lower level okay so now we discuss states of flow but then so, uh, yes question uh -huh. yeah so, sir one thing so, uh -huh. sir whenever we throw a pebble it it always moves in a like circular direction sir how we can say it's moving upward or like upstream or downstream it it's move so the entire the end, i am thinking uh, so you are talking about a, a canal or a lake uh sir when what sir we can say lake otherwise sir uh, uh, sir in a river how it's their water is moving from somewhere to somewhere but in in a lake it's stable now it's not moving so sir how we can say it upstream or downstream uh, yes so if if they see if the uh okay uh, in a lake you you will not have any flow right you will not have any flow so the wave will move in all the directions obviously right but here i was talking about in in channels if you have a small channel and if you drop a pebble uh you will see that the initially the wave will be uh, over it will be round um around all the around that pebble but then because the flow is happening uh the wave for example initial let's say i'll i'll plot here let's say this is the initial wave uh if the flow is happening here then you will see something like this you will see less here and more going here this will discuss more in uh, why this is happening because the flow velocity is too high so here most of the wave is these are waves okay most of the wave are moving downstream that is that is what i meant when i said that because the flow is moving downstream and flow velocity is too high than the celerity of the wave does that a uh, little bit answer your question no, yeah yes sir now it's clear yeah yeah okay uh, so based on the uh, states of flow that is uh, whether we have laminar or turbulent or transitional and the gra gravitational that is whether we have subcritical or supercritical most often we see four regimes of flow that is the regime means the overall effect of the gravity and viscosity uh, we might have laminar flow and we might have subcritical flow so that is true we might have turbulent flow also and still subcritical subcritical only gives us information about the velocity so velocity is less but the flow is still turbulent right the viscosity is still less uh, for example uh, air has less velocity it might be traveling at a very small speed but it is still turbulent because the wave uh, air particles they don't have any fixed pos position similarly we have two other more uh, apparent regimes laminar and supercritical and turbulent and supercritical so those will be our uh, four regimes we might discuss that more in next section if needed uh so that is that is it for today um any any questions uh, that you would like to ask in this lecture sir uh, somehow we are not able to access the material which you are uploading on the cloud i see okay okay uh, that's uh, so good. to please upload it on the uh, platform which you used in the previous semester like uh, sites.google acha okay okay yeah see uh, Yeah, yeah, that I think that is very really possible. Can use uh, Google uh, Google Classroom as well. We are okay with it. Okay, okay. So that that option I will try. So is that that is um, same problem with everyone or just one person? Abhijit uh, only. Just uh, with everyone because uh, it's written as a uh, files not found. We are not able to even see see those files. I see, I see. But I, I know I uploaded those. Maybe there might be like sharing is not, you know, I have not shared it here yet, or there is some sharing issue. But obviously, I will, I will, um, I think I will upload upload it on multi. I have already uploaded it on YouTube also. I will upload it on uh, some other, like you said. So I'll explore some other options uh, so that you can uh, you get access. So presentations also you are not able to see, or just the uh, videos. Uh, no so videos uh, we are able to see on youtube but uh, presentations are not uh, we are not able to access them i see i see yeah yeah so so those i i will try to sort out this today or tomorrow okay okay sir fine okay any yeah. other question
Sir, can you explain that upstream and downstream, how exact it will be in the channel flow case? Uh, okay. So when I, let's say this is, this is, this is your channel. Okay. This is your channel bed. Let us make it bed like here. So it has, it has some slope. So if the flow is happening in this direction, right? This we call upstream and this we call downstream, right? Because the flow is happening from the upstream to the downstream section. That is what I meant by upstream US and this is downstream. Okay, does that answer your question? So I mean, uh, though they are on the same level, uh, like though they are on the same height also. No, no, no they, they are here. Yeah, they can have it. It only depends on the direction of the velocity, right? Yes. You might have even we'll see later very rare cases. The slope is upwards, but the flow is may happen, you know, in this direction. In that case, this will be upstream and this will be down, downstream. In this case, the flow is not exactly real, but you can still have such equation, such uh, cases when the flow is moving against this, you know, gravity. Yes. Okay. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, then I guess we can stop here. Take care, guys.